All right, excellent. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, my name is Robert. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about quantifying uh, and trying to understand the growth and evolution of open source communities using Apache Superset and actually an all open source data stack underneath Superset. Um, this is going to be kind of like a discussion about a work in progress uh, project. There were some definite like data related challenges that I ran into while working on this. And I kind of want to like be transparent and talk about what those challenges are and maybe give people a sense of like, what can be done these days with the current generation of open source data tooling when it comes to trying to get data about for the purpose of like managing and developing an open source community. Uh, so first, for those that don't know me, just a little bit about who I am. Um, I'm, a, I'm a data engineer. I'm a developer advocate at a company called Preset, which we'll talk about very shortly. Um, my background is in scientific research, computational biology, math, and open source software. So I've, I've uh, most of the work that I've done has involved creating open source software to address some kind of scientific question. Um, I, I would describe myself as like a, a data architecture and best practices nerd. So I'm, I'm, I'm really like uh, sucked into and interested in ideas about architectures. And in general, I love open source software. I mean, I've, I've contributed to open source software for uh, the vast majority of my life since my teenage years. Um, and I, I really believe in like the, the promise and the mission of open source. And you're supposed to typically include some kind of like human interest images uh, in the about you slide. So you can see there, I'm, I'm an avid herpetologist. I have one of my little one of my little pals there wearing a tiny hat. Um, and yeah, presets the company I work for. And uh, the most of the scientific work that I did was connected to like studying the biophysics of DNA RNA hybrids. So uh, Quick agenda, uh, what are we talking about today? We're gonna do a quick primer on Apache Superset. I don't suppose that necessarily everyone or maybe even anyone here is familiar with what Apache Superset is. So we're just gonna talk about that really briefly. Uh, and then from the perspective of someone who's a developer advocate and is like uh, embedded in the community and is really interested in what's going on in the community and like creating the best, most healthy community possible. We'll talk about like open source community management using open source tools. That's really like what I would say is the focus of the talk today. And then we'll talk about like kind of things that I learned along the way while working on this project. And hopefully there's some information in there that's useful more generally to other folks who also are working with open source communities. So uh, first of all, Apache Superset, what is it? Uh, it's a, a data uh, analysis and visualization software. It's a BI tool. Um, what uh, distinguishes it from other sort of like leading BI options out there is that it's open source. Um, it, it's the most popular open source tool of its kind. And it's kind of distinguished from some of the other open source BI solutions out there in, in a couple ways. One is, um, you know, being under the governance of the ASF is a very, uh, I mean, we view it as a very positive thing for the project. Um, also, Superset was really designed with like enterprise use cases in mind, like enterprise deployments, not, not as much like necessarily smaller use cases. So things like uh, row-based security, efficient, efficient caching, um, support for single sign-on in the in the preset cloud form. All of those things are uh, are basically a core part of the project and are things that we've we've cared about since the beginning. Uh, just a quick little bit of history. So um, there's a gentleman by the name of Max. Uh, he's he's pretty well known in the community as like a data engineer. He's also the original creator of Apache Airflow. Uh, he was at Airbnb in 2015, and and they basically needed a visualization layer for Druid. Um, so at the time. Uh, basically Max threw, threw this thing together as a hackathon project and called it Panoramics after a, uh, a sort of well-known series of Belgian cartoon. Uh, and it's the name of the Druid actually in, in that cartoon series. Um, it got rebranded down the line a little bit and, oh, and spun out of Airbnb as Apache Superset. Uh, and the Apache Software Foundation, obviously, I mean, we're, we're at the ASF conference, uh, pr provides a lot of like really important uh, qualities to an open source project, not the least of which is, is governance. Um, in 2019, Max founded a company called Preset, and basically the mission of Preset was to take Apache Superset, uh, grow it, and build it into the best BI solution that exists anywhere, open or closed source, and then ultimately use it to democratize data access and data analytics across organizations. Uh, and the project recently crossed a pretty big milestone right at the beginning of the year in January. Uh, we did the, this big version 1.0 release. Uh, the Superset graduated from the ASF incubator program as a top level project. And so now uh, the, the future is bright for Superset. So quick things like Superset's got a lot of features that are relevant to the enterprise use case. I won't go into like detail on all of these per se, but the important things to be aware of are um, we're actually integrating Superset with another Apache Software Foundation project, which is the eCharts project. It's like the largest open source 
charting library around. So we're gradually bringing more and more eCharts into Superset, and we're, we're trying to use eCharts as like the primary charting library in Superset. Um, things that are relevant for enterprise security, so granular permissions, uh, caching, support for what we call the modern data stack. So Apache Superset uses uh, this thing called SQL Alchemy that allows it to communicate to like the vast majority of SQL speaking data sources. And then like certain backend capabilities, like the ability to be automatically notified via Slack bot, uh, get emails with alerts in them, get, uh, get reports um, on a scheduled basis sent out to certain people in your organization. So there, there's a lot you can do with Superset. It's a very powerful tool. I was actually, as someone who started working in this space like about a year ago, I was I was astounded by uh, what is actually possible in Superset, given that it's an open source tool in a space that traditionally is not open source and is not particularly friendly to open source. Um, so I'm going to skip past these slides because they're not they're not the most important thing in the world, and we have other cool stuff to talk about. But the important thing here is that Superset talks to almost any SQL speaking data source uh, via SQL Alchemy, which is a project you should look into, by the way, if, if you've never heard of it. It's it's a really cool thing. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that use Superset. Uh, and ultimately, I think that the reason that is, is it, it boils down to what I would call like the value proposition of open source BI. So BI, for those that don't know in, in this space, has been dominated by closed source software. Actually, things that were originally created as like desktop applications for quite some time. So like Power BI, Tableau, uh, Looker, things like that. Um, but, the, but actually, open source has a lot to offer BI. Um, extensibility, so particularly the ability to build custom analytics, uh, your own uh, visualization types and doing visualization plugins, being able to embed it into, into other products, into websites, uh, being able to take it apart and use it in a piecemeal fashion. Uh, all of those things are, are a major value proposition. Uh, avoiding vendor lock-in is also really important, right? Closed source BI uh, locks you into whatever the ecosystem is that you're working in. and um, being open source sort of gives you gives you back control over your analytics layer. Uh, the, the cost is free to use, uh, free to modify, but it can be kind of expensive to maintain an enterprise deployment. Um, so that's, that's something to be aware of. Uh, quality, um, I, I, and, and this is a personal thing. I mean, I, I think I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but I personally believe that open source is like a much better process for making software in the long run than, than closed source. I think that like, if you look at certainly every other part of the data stack, you can see that like the arc of history definitely bends towards open source. And ultimately, I believe that that's probably something that's gonna happen in the BI layer as well. And I, and I sort of feel like Apache Superset is maybe the project that is in the process of making that happen. Um, so uh, I just wanted to talk briefly about like the architecture of Superset for any nerds in the room or maybe curious about like how it works. Um, basically, you got your data sources on the bottom. Uh, SQL Alchemy essentially allows you to take SQL queries and, and take the response from those SQL queries and then wrap them in like a pandas data frame. Um, and then you've got uh, the front end is a, is a React front end and it basically is three different apps. So you have the, the dashboard view, explore mode, and then the SQL lab tab. And these things basically give you different different faces, different ways of approaching the data and, and doing things. Um, so explore mode is like the chart creation mode. You can see here like you, you can choose from many different chart types. You can see like what the schema is on the far left. Um, you can you can kind of see like uh, you can kind of see, you have like a, a large scrolling bar that has a lot of different controls in it. Uh, you've got in chart analytics available, so this is this is something that I really want to highlight. And this is one of the cool things about like open source BI actually, as opposed to closed source BI. You have a Python package that does some stuff with pandas data frames that you would like to be able to visualize in your BI layer. You can actually add it to Superset. Um, you, you can't add it to to closed source BI. So uh, the ability to uh, integrate packages like Facebook's profit package for time series analysis, um, a lot of the useful things from, from NumPy and Pandas that allow you to like uh, take like rolling windows and to, to like group and sort data, um, all that stuff can be surfaced in the, in the chart view in Superset. So that's pretty cool. I like that a lot. SQL Lab is kind of like the SQL IDE. So it provides you with like oh, pretty much what you would expect out of a SQL IDE, except it's, it's just kind of like lightweight and clean. Uh, I personally like the interface of SQL Lab a lot. And then the dashboard view, which is I think where most people who use Superset interact with it. And it allows you to essentially just see collections of charts. You can organize them. You can create markdown cells to provide in dashboard documentation. Um, all, all of these things are very valuable. So. I wanna talk now about some of the challenges that are facing the Superset community, uh, in, in my opinion. And this is kind of like uh, 
to some extent, a representation of how we view things at preset, but also some of this is kind of like my own take. So that's that's kind of my disclaimer. I think one challenge that we're that we're really facing in the superset community is that we have a lot of personas involved, uh, and in particular, people who are actively involved in superset development are not the same thing as supersets end users. Um, developers are not necessarily the people who are creating and consuming dashboards the most. And so it creates kind of a disconnect between the people that are actually using the project and the people that are that are building the roadmap for it, uh, actually doing the work to develop it. Um, and so trying to figure out how to get voices from the end user community into the conversation about refining and developing Superset has been, I think, a pretty significant challenge. Um, so if I had to say, like, what are the general archetypes of the persona that we have in the Superset community, I would say if you go into Superset Slack right now, the vast majority of the people that you see there are going to be developers and data engineers. They're interested in deploying, modifying, maintaining Superset. Maybe they want to contribute code or other artifacts to the project. Uh, they get excited about data source connectivity, easier things related to deployment, uh, embedded use cases, and kind of like the potential of being able to grow Superset into whatever their organization needs it to be. Um, analysts and data scientists are what, in, in contrast, I would call like the actual primary end user. So these, these folks care more about the analytics and the BI capabilities of Superset. They get excited about uh, like user interface improvements, uh, in, like bringing new graphs into the project, general usability improvements, but they don't like necessarily have any intention or interest in contributing code to the project or documentation. They don't necessarily care about the same things that the developer or the data engineer cares about. So really, like the way I see it, the divide between the developer and data engineer and the analyst and data scientist is like, that gap has to be bridged somehow. And I think like active community management is one way that you can bridge that gap. And then like the third category would be like maybe the executive or the business decision maker. They may also be an analyst or a data scientist. They may also be an, a data engineer or a developer, but they also may be none of those things. Uh, and oftentimes they end up choosing, like making the final call on whether to use Superset at an organizational level. Um, and, and these people tend to care more about the operational and like business dimensions of commercial or I guess commercial open source if you're using Preset Cloud. But if you're using Superset, just like those dimensions of open source. So uh, cost, what's it going to take to maintain? What are we allowed to do under the license? Uh, what's the governance of the project? Like, are, are there assurances that, our, that our, our, our effort, our contributions, if we make them, are going to be protected? Um, all of those things are much more important to the to the sort of like executive persona maybe than to the developer or to the, the data scientist or the analyst. Um, so that's challenging. Uh, number two is that the Superset community, uh, particularly as it's represented on GitHub, is uh, extremely large and, and rapidly growing. So um, we have over 40,000 stars on GitHub now, over 1,000 open issues, which is like, ugh. I mean, big projects do have a lot of open issues, but like, so something about that 1,000 open issue number really like resonates in people's minds and kind of like makes them want to do something about it. So we've been hosting like issue bashes in the community in an attempt to like just push it down a little bit. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, like I think a data-driven approach to issue management is is really the long-term solution as an open source project scales up. Um, so that's one of the major challenges that we face. Also, want to just show a graph of like stargazers over time. You can see that. The growth of the project is relatively linear outside of the um, outside of the the very early sort of like the big bang at the beginning, and then also there's some events that happened in early 2021, uh, which we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, number three would be like growth attribution. So I, I would say like what's making an impact in the community. If we want to grow the superset community, or if we want to improve some particular metric about it, like how long people have to wait after opening a PR before a committer or a PMC member takes a look at it. Um, we want to know what actions we're taking actually are having an impact on the growth of the community. So the ability to, for example, view stargazers over time lets us sort of like line that up with other actions that we may be taking in the community and try to see if we can like develop some sense of attribution. So I've annotated a couple events on here. The 1.0 release in ASF graduation, the announcement and sort of like the, the PR push around that had a significant effect on the size of our community. Uh, and you can see like the, the typical release is, is much more of like a little tiny little bump. Uh, four, uh, and, and this is really the big one in my mind. Like, as far as I'm concerned, this is, this is the biggest problem facing open source communities. It's also the most unsolved problem, uh, which is what I would say is nurturing a particular culture, which is a culture that's uh, inclusive, um, 
self-sustaining, which is to say that it doesn't require the organizations that originally propped up the project to continue investing enormous amounts of effort in the community. Ideally, you want people in the community who care about the project and are excited about solving problems with the project. You want those people to step up and be the people who are answering questions, helping new people get oriented on the project, helping guide uh, like first time contributors and guiding maybe people who are joining the community seeking information about using Superset in their institution. Um, and then also kind of like a culture of altruism. And I, and I guess I guess like altruism and self-sustaining are kind of connected, right? If people are if people are acting altruistically, it's sort of like at least one theory could be that it, it fosters like a, a larger community of altruism, sort of maybe inspires altruism in other people and drives them to um, make a positive impact on the community. So figuring out how to do that is is a serious challenge. And, and I think that that's the thing that is uh, most unanswered and would be the best to explore in a data-driven way in like a long-term sort of sense. Uh, but all of these things can be addressed with data. So uh, for personas trying to understand who's in the community, what they care about, we can do persona classification. We can also look at um, you know basic stuff like what time zones are people distributed in? Are we hosting our events in the right time zones? Um, two would be like uh, issue tracking dashboards, uh, ensuring that new contributions are being touched, which is to say that Someone with with keys on the project is actually taking a look at issues that people open, responding to people, making new folks in the community who are trying to contribute to the project, even if it's just by opening a bug report as an issue. We want those people to feel heard. We want them to feel touched, like there's someone in the project who recognizes what they're trying to do and and cares about the like cares about actually seeing that uh, sort of paid forward in the project. Um, for growth attribution, we can look at, uh, so one thing we could do is we can implement like analytic frameworks, like growth accounting on top of data derived from like Slack and GitHub from the community. Also, we could just look at time series data and we could, we could try to like attribute kind of like we were doing earlier. Like we can try to attribute certain changes in the community, like a sudden spike in stargazers. We can try to like say, oh, well that was probably the, the consequence of these actions that we took at this time. Uh, and for nurturing a culture, I think, Finding and recognizing people in the community is a strategy that I see in other open source communities that I think uh, works well and that I like a lot. I mean, people contribute to open source projects for a lot of different reasons and altruism is not always at the front of people's minds. Sometimes people are looking for public props. People are looking for recognition and being able to automatically sort of like find and identify those people, make sure that we're able to recognize their contribution to the project and encourage them to continue. Um, that's something that we would like to be able to do as well. Uh, so overall, what we're really trying to do here is support the superset community. That's our first and primary goal uh, as a company and also like myself individually. Uh, learn things about the broader open source eco ecosystem by being able to compare data from, from other open source projects, um, projects that we consider to be like uh, reference points or like good benchmarks for how we're doing uh, as a community. Uh, use all open source tools uh, to evaluate the maturity of an entirely open source data stack. In other words, no ad hoc data engineering. And, and this turned out to be actually the tough part of this project. Um, a lot of data engineering is just like, oh, we need to get data from this API into this part of the data warehouse. I'm just going to write a script that does that, right? But ultimately, like, if the open source data ecosystem, if the open source data stack is reaching a high level of maturity, we should, like, be able to avoid doing ad hoc data engineering. Um, so. I sort of wanted to go on this journey of trying to build a tool with an entirely open source data stack and just like see what that looks like in the year 2021. Um, and then I also wanted to kind of like share the knowledge that I gained doing this with the broader open source community and ultimately share like resources and a reference architecture, which is something that, um, you know, it's, it's much harder to do in a, in a data engineering setting. And it's something that I would like to uh, be able to share. So first let's talk about ingestion. There's uh, the open source ecosystem for ingestion is pretty, I would say it's like kind of exploding right now. There's a number of uh, new sort of like open core companies that got funded fairly recently. Um, kind of like in, in more of a longer historical sense, the Singer ecosystem has been like one of the primary ways to get data from one place to another. So the Singer ecosystem defines this concept of like a tap and a target. Each one is its own individual open source project with its own original creator, its own set of people that care about maintaining it, or maybe no one that cares about maintaining it, depending on how used or unused the particular tap is. Um, so 
the, the Singer ecosystem is out there. It's been out there. Companies have been partially built on it, such as I think like uh, Stitch comes to mind. Uh, and you also have tools like Meltano, which are building on top of the uh, building on top of the Singer ecosystem and essentially trying to um, trying to be like kind of a meta orchestrator that brings everything together, like uh, extraction, loading, transformation of the data, um, uh, orchestration. Uh, documentation, visualization. Meltano, ultimately, I think the vision for Meltano is to bring all of those things under management and be able to like sort of configure and manage everything as code. Airbyte takes like a slightly different approach and approaches things more from the perspective of let's do like this fully containerized architecture where all of the data connectors, rather than being individual open source projects, are gonna be, they're gonna be part of the mono repo. Uh, they're going to be implemented in the project as a as a docker container and then we're going to build this like framework on top of these docker containers and docker containers are going to be the things that do all the work um and i i tried uh, all of these things out in the in the course of trying to build this project and i found that uh, airbyte was the most straightforward to set up and use and so i decided to go with that for this project but uh, it should be noted that there are definitely advantages to Meltano and the Singer ecosystem, particularly just the breadth of data sources that are available for Singer is like huge. So uh, if you're looking for like more obscure data sources, that might be a way to go. Also, of course, there's closed source alternatives to these tools. Like there's ways to do this. Uh, Fivetran comes to mind as one, one like uh, service-based alternative that's entirely closed source, but we want to use open source tools. So decided to go with Airbyte for the ingestion layer. For transformation and data validation, there's a lot of options out there right now. Um, I elected to go with uh, DBT for this project because I, I sort of wanted to follow the extract, load, transform paradigm, um, which is to say you extract and load the data into like a, a landing schema or like a base data schema in your data warehouse. And then you apply transformation tests and can provide documentation for the data as well uh, using DBT. For those that aren't familiar with DBT, um, they have a a very strong and rapidly growing uh, open source community. And, and I personally think of them as like one of the reference points for like, what does a, what does a self-sustaining community look like? I think the DBT community is like a really good example of that. The Apache Spark community is also a really good example of that. And then tools like Great Expectations, which are designed to provide like uh, documentation and validation and fit better into like more the Apache Spark, like, notebook batch data ecosystem than like the SQL based in warehouse transformation ecosystem, which is more like what DBT is about. So I decided to go with DBT for this project. And then ultimately for visualization and analytics, we went with Apache Superset, uh, AKA uh, Preset Cloud. Uh, Preset Cloud essentially is just Apache Superset, uh, but productionized in the cloud. Um, all of the like backend dependencies and configuration handled and still free. Uh, which is really, really cool. If you want to try Apache Superset out, but you don't want to put any effort into setting up or configuring it or dealing with like anything related to, to setup and configuration, just go make an, make an account on Preset Cloud. It's free and you can try Apache Superset that way and see if you like it. Um, so ultimately the architecture looks a little bit something like this. We're using different Airbyte connectors to extract data from Slack, GitHub. There's a lot of other options to Google Analytics, HubSpot, not using that for this particular project, but uh, Airbyte has connectors for those things. We load them into like a staging or like a landing schema. We apply transformations to the data using DBT and we can run tests against the data to validate it. Uh, and then we load it into like a final schema, which is then accessible in, in Preset Cloud and in, uh, in Apache Superset. Uh, I would say that this, this data stack is maturing. Uh, you can use whatever you want as an actual data source. Currently I'm using BigQuery, which is not open source, but uh, originally I was working with Postgres, which is open source. And, and you, can, you can swap with the database out for whatever it is that you wanna use. You just may have to tweak the DBT models. Um, so so what, what, what can we actually learn from, from using this data stack to extract data from these communities? Well, there, there's a few things. And, and what I'm gonna show is like, kind of, it's kind of basic. It's stuff that we can see just looking straight at the data. What I really wanted to talk about was more of like a, more of like a abstract comparative approach to community management where we, we like compare major open source projects and like try to draw some conclusions from it. But I ran into some barriers actually with the data. And that's kind of what I would like to share. Uh, first though, just some basic stuff that we can learn. So one useful concept, uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and, and this isn't like an, an entirely original idea or anything, but basically uh, I, I define these two notions of like shepherds and champions. So shepherds are people that are really active in 
Slack channels that are focused on guiding new people in the project. So beginner questions, beginner contributing, uh, channels like that. And so we can we can basically take a time window and we can look at who in the community is, is making the largest contribution in those areas to make sure that we've touched those people, that we've reached out to them to tell them that we appreciate what they're doing, send them some swag, thank them for like just being involved in the community and try to like encourage more uh, more like virtuous cycles of altruism within the community. You notice that there's a name that sticks out uh, pretty strongly here. That's that's Mr. Strini. Uh, he's very, very active in our Slack community and uh, he's also a preset employee. And he's also giving a talk later today. So if you're interested in sort of getting his take on, I think a more like Slack focused uh, take on the community, he's, he's a, a good talk to go to. You should check that out. Uh, and then champions are people who basically are, are sort of have moved to the level of, of actively evangelizing superset inside the community. So we can apply word filters to things that people say in Slack. We can look at a particular set of channels and ask questions about who is active in those channels, who is most likely to respond, how long does it take people to respond, generally speaking? Like how long does it take someone who posts an issue in beginner questions in our, in our Slack to get help? Um, so there's a lot we can learn by looking at the Slack data. Uh, and you can build dashboards that are based on that data as well. This is this is one dashboard that was created essentially entirely from Slack metrics. Just shows some basic stuff like channel membership, activity on a time window, um, champions, people who are active in support, um, the distribution of users across time zones, things that are useful for community management, and then the total user count, of course, as well. Um, also, we can look at GitHub issues, uh, open issues by activity. It's really easy to sort and say, what are the most active open issues right now? Make sure that we have uh, essentially that someone who has the keys to the GitHub account is taking a look at those issues and that those issues are actually being addressed. Um, that's really important. And ultimately, uh, what I would like to share is some some learnings from this effort to, to build this. One is that uh, Production ready open source extract and load is not a solved problem. Um, Airbyte, Meltano, uh, the Singer ecosystem, these, these players are trying to address this, but th the biggest issue there is that there's just so many different data sources. Like how do you build a community of people that's gonna be interested in not just creating new connectors, but also like maintaining those connectors over time as the APIs that, they're, that they actually communicate with also evolve. Um, that that's a totally unsolved problem. I don't think that this, the Singer ecosystem has figured it out. I don't think that that Airbyte has figured it out yet. Um, but it, it's going to be interesting to see these projects kind of grapple with that and and work out maybe a novel solution. Uh, two is that transformations are best isolated in their own step in a batch data pipeline. So tools like uh, well, I should I should really talk about Airbyte specifically. Airbyte has the ability to carry out uh, DBT transformations. Uh, at the time that it extracts and loads the data. But what I found was that uh, it's much easier to have all the transformations managed in the same place and to just treat it as a separate step in the pipeline. So uh, that, that was something that I learned. Also, many atomic transformations is, is very preferable to doing fewer, more complex transformations. Um, and, and this is basically for the reason of like reusability and also making it easier to kind of like debug a complicated graph of transformations. Uh, dedicated orchestration is is absolutely a must, like using Airflow or something similar. Uh, strongly recommended. And projects like Meltano actually integrate pretty tightly with Airflow. And I believe Airbyte also has a an Airflow operator now. So uh, both projects have some integration with Airflow. And then also uh, community management on Slack in particular. Not that it's easy to get the GitHub data, but community management on Slack in particular is really tough for reasons that mostly boil down to data access. Uh, the Slack API is aggressively rate limited. Um, my understanding is that is essentially to make it difficult to get historical data from those communities. So it's kind of like purposefully antagonistic towards this type of data analysis. Um, Slack is maybe not the best place to host a conversation for a community. I know it's like the path of least resistance because it's what everyone uses for their for their day to day work. And so it's easy to just have a set of communities open that you're involved in. But it's not a good platform for, for dealing with like questions you have many of the same questions occur over and over again and have to be answered repeatedly. Um, I, one thing we're thinking about in the community is like, how can we create a better forum for, for asking and answering questions? And in general, how can we build an end user community that allows us to get the critical feedback that we need from those, those data analysts, those data scientists to build superset into the best possible BI product that it can be. Um, so 
all these things are are things that I learned while working on this project. I wish that I had like a, a, a deeper, like more more rich comparative analysis of major open source projects. But as it turns out, um, actually extracting and loading the data using all open source tools, certainly at scale. Like for example, there was a time in this project when I was pulling data from the top like 20 open source projects in the world. And the extract load frameworks that exist right now kind of buckle under the, under the load of doing that. So unless you want to sit down and write some of your own Python scripts ad hoc, which I was committed to not doing for this project because it's kind of an exploratory experimental project and we had some goals, um, the, it, the, there just is no great way to do this right now. And it would be really interesting to uh, hear if this is a solved problem elsewhere, like if anyone else has solved the extract load problem, if you want to collect data about the top 20 open source communities in the world, is there a way to do that outside of like writing some scripts on your own that loads them? Is there a is there like a production ready framework that can be used? And, and if so, um, what are you using? I'm a little bit curious. And uh, that is about all I have. Thanks for joining me today. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. I'm happy to take questions. I think we have like a very small amount of time. Uh, but yeah, any questions that folks have, I'm, I'm happy to uh, happy to help out, happy to answer questions. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Derek. I I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I originally wanted to like really present something that was more like uh, meaty, with like more of a, a scientific comparison of of like metrics of interest across different communities, but found ultimately that getting the Getting the data reliably into my architecture was something that I could not do with with existing uh, open source frameworks, um, at, at least in a way that would be like appropriate for for like a production system where we would actually be looking at this on a daily basis. And I, I'm I'm hoping that that's something that we can solve in the near future. Any questions before we wrap things up? Cool. Well, thanks for joining me today. Uh, it, it was a pleasure. I hope everyone continues to enjoy their, yeah, disconnect committers versus users. Yeah, that's that's definitely something. And it, it, uh, that's also something that's kind of unique. I mean, I don't want to say unique. Like, there are other open source projects that face this problem. But especially in the world of open source data tooling, right, a, a lot of that stuff is designed for engineers. Like, it's built by engineers for engineers. BI is not built for engineers. Um, so there's, there's a lot of considerations with, like, the the, the UX has to be really good. It has to be intuitive. It has to be like comparable to the already mature, like closed source software in this space that is uh, that is currently dominant in the market. Uh, that's that's really tough. Uh, one thing we've thought about a lot in the superset community is like how to involve designers in in the open source process. People who don't they don't they're not they're not really going to contribute like documentation. They're not really going to contribute code per se, but having like actual professional designers who are able to